Hey gang, Carl White here, broadcasting from the secret headquarters here in the studios today at the Mortgage Marketing Animals, and you're listening to Loan Officer Freedom, number one podcast in the world today for loan officers, and that just makes me really cool. Like, that just makes, no, I'm just, that makes you guys cool, and I've got a very dear friend of mine, a guest, uh, somebody that's helped me grow my mortgage business. Uh, I can't think of anybody else that's had more of an impact, uh, Kevin. And there's that's quite a statement because there's been some uh, major impacts in my in my career over the years. Um, I I I cannot think of anybody that's had more of an impact than you. So I appreciate. You. So, Mr. Kevin Broton, how you doing, my man? I'm good, buddy. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, a, you having me on, and then b you saying those kind words. I don't know. Uh, I hope that's true because uh, I say the same in reverse every single conversation I have. I say I've been impacted by three people in my life in the 30 years I've been doing this, and you're the number one that's impacted my life. Um, and so I, I'm just grateful to be on and thankful for our friendship. Well, you know what the good news is? We both doing this long enough. We don't need to fool anybody. We can tell always tell the truth, oh, but the truth, the truth is pretty day. awesome. Yeah, I find the older I get, the less I'm incur uh, the less I'm tempted uh, to stretch things or anyway. So uh, makes no sense. You don't need to, and that's that's the joy of uh, doing what we do. We can just be honest and transparent, and tell the truth, and those that are attracted to it come to us, and those that aren't aren't. So it's okay. That's right. They wouldn't be listening right now. So hey, so what we're going to talk about today is, um, dude, you wrote a book. I did. And this is I not, did. Wait, wait, and let me clarify. This is not one of those things where. Uh, you told somebody to write a book and you slapped your name on it. You wrote a book. I wrote every page. Yep. Yeah. And this one, the main topic, what the, the name of the book is called Loan Officer Success. Well, I did. And I picked that name because you own the domain name LoanOfficerSuccess.com. So I thought I, that maybe I could finagle a use of the of the domain name out of you someday. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how that works. So, yeah. uh, so um so I, the, the subheadline to this is 12 proven practices to grow leads and grow your income. But where you got the book was you actually did an interview of a group of people. Tell me about tell me about the inspiration where you got the information to write the book. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I did. Um, I got very lucky, you know, I'm I, because of kind of the role I'm in, I'm able to talk to a lot of people and. I think maybe I'm a bit of a nerd or a geek or something, but I was always intrigued why some people had massive success, Carl, and some people didn't. And, and they carry the same license. They work at similar companies. They have access to largely the same mortgage products. They have basically the same rate sheet, basically the same comp plan. So why are some people wildly successful and others fail or, or are average? And it, that kind of intrigued me. And so... I one day got the chance to interview a $130 million a year producer. And I was pretty blown away by her responses to some of my questions. So I sent out on a mission and I found 11 people that had closed over a hundred million in a year that were willing to talk to me. And I gathered from them um, just a bunch of topics I had that I wanted to talk about. And they were kind enough with their time to give me honest answers. And I came up with 12 commonalities that those people had that I thought average loan officers don't possess all 12. And so I thought, hey, maybe I could help people by writing a book. And I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel. But if, if 11 people who did over 100 million a year are willing to tell me how they did it, why not write a book about it and see if others might follow the blueprint? Does that make sense? It does. You know, I'm a big proponent of, and uh, those, my listeners know, and I know you know, Kevin, I'm a big NASCAR fan. Yeah. And I'm I'm really big about staying in the draft. And the draft means you get two cars out there or 10 or 20 cars all riding together. Uh, each car goes faster in the pack than they do by themselves. They do. And, and that's kind of what we're talking about is getting in the draft of somebody because the person who got us in the draft, they'll move faster and then we'll move faster because we kind of push them and they pull us. They pull so us, that's cool. right. Well, let's jump into the, uh, as much as we have time for, we might end up making this a two-parter, but we might could pull it off in one. Sure, sure. So what's the, what's the first thing? Of the 12, so, total 12, what's number one? Number, well, and it's number one, number one, because it's number one, or is number one, number one, because you just had to grab a first one? Well, I broke it down when I got the 12 kind of things that I thought were different from regular folks. I broke it into three sections because it really is three sections. So the first section is really about personal development. And the only chapter in this book that's actually really deep thinking is the first chapter. And here's what I mean by that. Um, what I found, these, these massive, huge producers, 
they thought differently on a daily basis than regular people do. Mm. And how so? Each of, each of them told me that thinking was a strategic asset. And I don't think most people think about that, right? They just think, mm -hmm. oh, I think, I guess. And these people all believe that thinking was a strategic asset and it's what set them apart from their competitors. Um, literally some of them, and I adopted this policy from one of them, they taught me that I now have 30 days on, or 30 minutes every single day on my calendar. Carl, it's an appointment with myself where all I can do is think. I'm not allowed to send an email, see an email, send a text, look at a text, anything. I can't take a phone call. I can only think 30 minutes a day. And I got that from one of these 11 producers, but it's really changed how I operate because I am way more engaged in, um, in my business because I spend a ton of time thinking and journaling every day. I do it every day because it makes sense. I wouldn't do that if it didn't produce a benefit for me. So chapter one was simply all about how people thought. Um, it's how they approached the day, how they believed in um, the value of prospecting, how they believed in being strategic, how they believed in everything. And if they thought differently than the average person, um, not shocking to you at all, but none of them thought the market sucked. Every one of them thought this is an opportunistic market. Most people are too lazy or unwilling to work. I'm not going to be that person. I think differently than them. And it was mm. just refreshing. So Chapter one is all about how you think. And there's some good examples in the book that highlight some of that. And obviously we don't have time to read the whole book today, but um, thinking was the first chapter. And so how people thought in that production level versus people that do 8 million or 10 million a year was not the same at all. And so I you thought know, that I, was interesting. I find that, uh, I find that uh, intriguing about setting aside, setting, setting aside 30 minutes to do nothing but think. And I think, I think you're onto something there because, you know, I've always thought the the biggest poison for business is being busy. I hate busy. I'll take yeah. two hours of productive over 10 hours of busy any day of the week. Yeah, busy usually doesn't get much. Usually, like, yeah, when somebody says they're busy, that's that's actually not a good sign. Like, I, I'll can decide. It's not a good sign. And I think uh, sometimes we fall trapped and trapped to that word because... I, I'm guilty of this. I used to wear it like a badge of honor. In fact, the first day I met you 12 years ago, I told you how busy I was all the time. And I took pride in the fact that I worked 60 hours a week and all that. It's all garbage. It has nothing to do with success. And I think there's some weird inner reality with people. They like to feel busy. But mm -hmm. the fact is, it does not produce better results. And every time I'm I'm busy, I'm not doing great. Every time I'm productive, I'm doing great. Mm, I like that. Boy, thinking, thinking, having white space in our day is very important. So, all right. So section one was personal development. First thing on there was thinking. What was number two? The second was, um, I'm not shocked by this one, but everyone does goal setting or a large majority of people in sales do goal setting, right? The way these people did goal setting was far different from normal people. Tell in me. fact, none of the 11 did annual goal setting. <laughs> Their goal setting was broken down at the highest amount of time quarterly, most of the time monthly, weekly, daily, sometimes mm -hmm. hourly. And it was awesome to see. These people were action junkies. They were, they goal set it about activities, not outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I've seen so many people say, I'm going to make a hundred grand. And they put a thermometer with zero to a hundred. And every time they get a $3,000 commission, they color it in in red. That's not how these people set goals at all. Their goals were, how can I increase my strategic IQ? How can I manage my team better? How can I be a better leader? What can I do on mm -hmm. Tuesdays and Thursdays that moves the needle? How many hours a day am I willing to prospect on Wednesdays and Fridays? They, these people were goal-setting fanatics, and I mm -hmm. loved it. It really got me juiced up because I don't see that with normal run-of-the-mill people. You know, They're not goal-setting fanatics, and these people were... I, I can't say it enough that the, the level of their goal setting was truly, truly a different it, stratosphere. It, you know, it sounds like they're doing uh, what I would call uh, micro goals. Where, could, and you know, you know, man, that makes, I've never thought about that, Kevin. That makes perfect sense. Cause like, if I put a goal for the end of the year, that's like doing a term paper and it's not due for 12 months. Yeah. Wh when am I going to start working on that? 11 months. 11 months and three weeks. That's yep. exactly right. Like somewhere right. in that neighborhood for sure. Whereas if I put it in a shorter term, I got to start taking action now because dude, it's my goal is due here in end of the day or end of next week or end of the month. 
And so I, I don't have time to diddle dally around. I like that. Yeah, I, I was really impressed by it. Um, it, it really, it, again, it kind of this book almost ended up being more for me because I've tried to imperfectly adapt every one of these 12 principles in my life because yeah. I wasn't an expert at these, you know, and uh, learning from a group of highly talented people was really exciting to me. Um, mm. The third one um, it's kind of a little crazy too, probably not one people think about, but all 11 of these folks were unbelievably strategically disciplined. And mm. there's a huge difference between discipline and strategically disciplined. Mm. And what I really gained knowledge from was these people were like, they weren't just, of course, they were all disciplined. You can't do that many units a year. One one gal did over 600 units. You know, you can't do that if you're not disciplined. But they were strategically disciplined in how many hours they did tactical things versus strategic things. Like they believed in a concept called strategic IQ, which is sometimes we get in this problem, like you, you talked about the busy thing, is if you just do, 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 and you never think, learn, or study, then you're inhibiting your ability to grow. And so these people were all strategically disciplined. And that mm -hmm. means that each of their days were time blocked like crazy, but they weren't haphazardly time blocked. They were well thought out. I, I do this on Tuesdays because I do this mm -hmm. from nine to 11 on Wednesdays because it produces a higher result than if I do it on Mondays from three to five. These people were strategic. And I mean, it shouldn't be a shock, but how many people do you know sit around and talk about strategic discipline? Mm. Not many. You, no, you know, you're, yeah. I can only think of one actually, other than you. And uh, that's our, our mutual friend, uh, Steve Kyles. Uh, he I'm is sure strategically he, disciplined, no doubt. No and, doubt. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not sure if he's the one that came up with this term or if he got it from somebody, but he's the first one I heard it from. Is he said, uh, discipline out trumps motivation every day always well it's true because you're either going to have the pain of discipline or the pain of regret you're going to have yeah. one of the two and discipline's not pain free i hate mm. to say it but mm. i mean i used to have my day run me and now i run my day thank god and there's a huge difference but being accountable and being disciplined every single day eight mm. to nine hours a day is not easy it just yeah. isn't you, you know that and 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 most people don't have the stones to do it. I don't know. You know, they just, they don't. And so what I loved about these 11 is they were all strategically disciplined. It's not even a topic I really placed much emphasis on before conducting these interviews. Does that mm. make sense? It, it does. So instead of waiting until I feel like prospecting, no, I prospect. And I'm just going to use this as an example from 9 a.m. until 11 a.m. Because that's what I do. And I don't, and I don't wait. Well, I don't feel like it. No, no, no. Feel like it or not, this is what I do from nine to eleven. So it wasn't um, an option. They, they yes, yeah. So number one was thinking. Number two was kind goal of setting. micro micro goal uh, setting. Micro goal setting. Strategic discipline. What's number four? Uh, and this kind of ended the first segment of the book. Number four was they were all lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is zero of the eleven had thought they made it. Zero of them were arrogant. Zero mm -hmm. of them told me they were the best. Zero of them didn't think there was room for improvement. All of them strive to be better. It was so cool. Because you think when you meet a group of seven, you know, digit two comma people, that you're going to get a couple arrogant ones in the group, right? I got none. And they were all lifelong learners. They all listened to po podcasts. They all did audio, audible books. They all went to seminars. Every single one of them had at least one coach. Nine of the 11 had multiple coaches. Mm -hmm. They, these people were learners. And I loved that because think of regular folks, you know, most of them aren't lifelong learners. You know, I look at you all the time. You, every single time I talk to you, you're telling me about an improvement strategy or a book you read that changed this way you think. You talk to it, you, you're kind of the synopsis of all these people yourself because so far, just think of those first four chapters. You think at a different level than most people. You goal set differently than most people. You're strategically disciplined every day, and you never thought you've made it. You have the largest coaching club in the country or whatever, and the best number one watch podcast in the world for mortgage people, and you still don't think you've made it. You still mm -hmm. are always trying to get better. And that's what I loved about these 11 people, because I thought 
I'd have at least a few samples of, oh no, I'm the king or I'm the queen. I didn't get that. And that to mm. me, that was really impressive. You know, that's interesting you say that. I never really thought about, dude, this is this is a great, uh, this is a great conversation. I never thought about this until you just mentioned it. I find the most pompous people tend to be lower producers that are are setting up a pretense. And and the ones that are doing well tend to be more kind, gentle, charming, not always, but but for the most part. And you know, I find that's also true of our referral partners that the higher producing real estate agents are actually tend to be more pleasant and more They're gentle. Nice people. More, They're great. Yeah, that's They're how great. they got to be so successful. So and you want right. to be around most of them. Yeah. All right. So so that's the end of, of the section one, which is personal development, thinking, goal setting, strategic discipline, lifelong learner. Section two, what's this about? Well, every one of them obviously had a team. Zero were individuals, right? So I wrote the whole second segment of the book on team building mm. because I've always been intrigued by team building because everyone we know wants a team, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of has a team. Even if you're a solo loan officer, you've got a processor, you've got an underwriter, you've got a closer, you've got teammates, right? No one does this alone. So I dug deep into what their teams meant because I knew something had to be different, right? You can't close 400 units or 600 units a year if you're not like, um, if your team's the same as someone who closes two units a month, right? Yeah. So this was my favorite part of the book, to be quite honest, was all 11 of them told me that culture matters. Every one of them. What do you, you know, we, we hear this buzzword. It's all about the culture. What, like, what is culture? Well, for them, it was like, here's the best way I guess I can say it. I think I probably wrote it better than I can talk about it, but um, they all had a vision statement, a mission statement. It was non-negotiable. The way the phones were answered in their office was non-negotiable. The way you ended a phone call was non-negotiable. The, the culture of their teams were followed to a T. There were minimum standards. There were consequences if you didn't meet the minimum standard. The consequence was you got fired. So their teams were not like normal teams. And a friend of mine taught me something pretty cool. And it was called, he, he calls it ACT. And he said, there's groups in this world, there's teams, and then there's high performing teams. And there's a huge difference between the three. A group is just people that come to work and hoping their paycheck clears on Friday. A team is a group of individuals that strive for some goal and a high performance team is based on accountability, communication, and trust who's firing on all eight cylinders every single hour of every single day for the sole and singular mission that's been described by the leader. And that's different. And what I loved about these people, their teams were exceptional. In a lot of the interviews, I got to talk to the teammates. They were as enthusiastic about the future as the loan officer was. There was no differentiator between the loan partner and the loan officer. They were as committed to the mission as, and so that's what I mean by culture, a culture of, this is no joke. This is non-negotiable. And it made me think of myself on my team. Am I the best teammate on my team? Am I helping everyone else? You had a friend of yours tell me recently that everyone's job is probably twice as hard as you think it is. Mm -hmm. And I never heard that before. And I never thought of it that way. But since that guy told me that, I've been acting differently. I've been a better teammate on my team because I don't always know what the other guy or gal's going through. You know, I think you and I on that particular call, I thought you saw a different side of what I do every day that you didn't really know. You know, yeah, I'm sure there's tons of things in your world that go on that I have no idea of. And so I was just unbelievably impressed with how important the culture of their team was to them and how there were consequences if you didn't buy in. Mm. Wow. I, 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 I like that too. It, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like a Super Bowl championship football team that the culture is you suit up, you show up, you do what you do, whatever it takes, legal, ethical, and moral, of course, yep, yep. but you do whatever it takes to make it happen. And those that don't, you're just not going to, you can play just not for this team. Yeah, you can stay in yeah. the industry and someone else will hire you. These people were unapologetic about it too. That's what I love most. Mm. It was just a, it was non-negotiable. And I, I don't know, I, I found that to be, 
different than regular folks I know. They, yeah. they don't think of their teams that way, and they sure as heck don't lead and manage their teams that way. You know, I, I think, uh, and, and, and brother, it's been a mistake I, I've done for sure in the past, is thinking my team was my friends first, right? Yes. And it's not saying I can't be friends with people on my team or be on, on a friendly basis per se, but the 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 team comes first, and this is serious business because people are counting on it. The rest of the team is counting on us, right? The processor is counting on us. The 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 closer is counting on us for a job. The underwriter needs us to do our job, or they don't have a job. And of course, the real estate agent, the home buyer, the title company, all those people need us to do our job. And it's 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 a serious thing, you know. It's not, and it's what not is- just about. Numbers. One of the loan officers told me there's 32 miles that get fed every month because of this culture here. It's wow. non-negotiable. 32 wow. miles need to be fed. Wow. And that was wow. the kids of the teammates and whatever. And I was like, man, I love this person. This guy, this guy was like, he was no joke. And I, I was like, I was very, very impressed. So I guess that that might be part of the next one, which uh, what you have here is like knowing the whys. So what yeah, do you mean but they, they took it to a different level. Um, you and I have had this conversation for over a decade, the importance of knowing your why, correct? Yeah. This didn't shock me at all, but I put it in the book because it's real. And zero of the 11's why was solely monetary. Yeah. Zero of the 11 had a why that was solely monetary. Yes, these people made an exceptional amount of money. They were all seven-figure people a year. Um but they weren't doing it to have a Lamborghini. They weren't doing it to buy a plane. They weren't doing it to get their third Rolex. You know what I mean? That it wasn't monetary. And when what they got most excited about of these 12 things I asked them was this one. And I some had very, very personal stories that I can't share because I told them I wouldn't. Um but they were about things bigger than money. And mm. I've always said that money's just a, f- a fleeting commodity. It's important. It, it funds lives. It fuels lives. And we all need it. But it's got to be more than money. And mm-hmm. and when I saw the passion in some of these people and the clear definition of why they were doing this, it really just re-solidified for me the importance of this topic. And I think it drives behaviors. You know, my why's gotten pretty well defined in the last five years. And that's why I work. I I have a very clear why and it drives my behavior. It's why I'm the first one here every single day. And that's no joke. That's not by happenstance. That's not because I have nothing else to do in the morning. I have a why that's really Mm -hmm. meaningful to me. And I think the more we define that and the more it has to do with something that isn't to make more money, um, the more behaviors change. You know, gosh, so I'll, I'll I'll give you a pet peeve of mine. Yeah. So I'll be talking to somebody and they'll say, you know, I, I'm doing okay. And and I and I understand that statement. They don't mean yep. anything. They don't mean any harm by it. I think they've just never somebody. So I said that to somebody one time years ago, and they taught me a lesson I've never forgotten. And I've always tried. This guy is uh, dead and gone now, but I've always tried to honor honor him by following through what he told me. He says, Carl. I get it. You're doing okay for you, but what about other people? This is not about you. This is about other people. So let me put it in modern day. So like my wonderful Miss Diane. So, and, and she's the one that comes to mind because she's been working with me the longest. So the lovely Mrs. White, myself, and my wife's name is Maria, not Diane, just in case somebody's new here. Yep. Uh, The day that we met Diane 25 years ago, she was my first uh, uh, employee. Employee team member, right? Yep, yep. And so for the last 25 years, uh, her and her wonderful, awesome husband, Scott, uh, Diane's been part of my team. And she counts on me that through thick and thin, markets up, markets down, rates are up, rates are down. Uh, her chips are all in. And she does what it takes to do her part. And she's counting on me to do my part to do what it takes. And if I don't do my part, she'd have to get laid off. And let me tell you something, that will never happen on my watch. In fact, it leads me into the next chapter. And I kind of jumped the gun on chapter five because chapter seven leads in. But it, it, the Diane Ranger example is is so apropos to what I'm about to say. So chapter seven is what I just said earlier about act. 
that's an acronym for accountability, communication, and trust. And what I found really awesome, and again, I loved these people. I loved getting to know them, and I loved that, that they gave me a, an inside look into their business and their life. But every one of them on their teams understood and believed in accountability, communication, and trust. And so you and I hear this all the time. But like, let's take the Diane thing first. You wake up every morning knowing Diane's been so loyal to you for 25 years. You have an obligation to run your business properly so she always cashes a check every other Friday, right? Yeah. I feel that way with my Teresa. Teresa's been with me 15 years. I love her. She was there for me when I was broke and not broke, and she never changed one bit. You know, everything is always, what can I do? She's never asked for anything for herself. She's, she's a selfless person. And I feel a sense of obligation to work as hard as I can so that she has increased opportunities. I already had my opportunity. I don't need to do any of this. I could, you know what I mean? And I, I do it for other people. And Dale Vermillion, who you really love and I love, he he wears a, a bit, band every day and says others first. And that guy lives an others first mindset. And what I loved about these producers, no matter how rich they got, they were others first they trusted in their teams. They communicated like maniacs and they were held accountable. Accountability is for winners. Winners love accountability. Losers mm -hmm. hate accountability. Mm -hmm. If you ever want to have a conversation, tell what someone's true business acumen is, ask them what their, their belief about accountability is. I guarantee you, losers hate accountability. They don't mm -hmm. want to be held accountable to anyone. But winners, they all love it. They don't see it as a burden. They don't see it as a negative. They see it as a driving force of their success. Mm -hmm. Accountability matters. And all of these folks believed in that. So chapter seven was the emphasis on accountability, communication, and trust amongst their teams. And mm -hmm. you and I have both met thousands of loan officers who say, yeah, but I can do it better than Shirley. So I, I don't trust anyone to touch my clients or my business. That's why they close three loans a month. Yeah. Because until you lose that mindset, and that goes back to chapter one, it's how you think, right? If that's how you think, there's limited... There's only 168 hours in a week. We're supposed to sleep 56 of them. We're supposed to groom ourselves and prepare ourselves for 12 of them. That only leaves 100 hours a week that you get to invest. If you're going to invest 50 in your business and 50 in your family, then how's that best spent, those 50 that you're going to invest in your business? And if you don't trust and communicate and hold people accountable and hold yourself accountable, you're not going to have a happy life. You know, you, you talk about trust. Um... I can't remember who I love giving credit to the people. And I, I, I talk to so many people. I, I sometimes can't remember somebody, yeah. somebody told me something you can have growth or you can have control, but you can't have both. Yeah. If you want growth. True. You gotta, you gotta trust. Great the saying. Great else, sentence. So. All you right. Just think about like, and I'll just end this. Like think of every great relationship you're in personal or business, right? I trust you implicitly. There's not one thing you can ever tell me that I don't say that's true. Never once. I've never questioned one word you've said to me because I trust you. And you're the same way with me, right? You don't, it, good or bad. I've told you things that aren't the greatest some days. Yep. You've told me things that aren't the greatest some days, but I never once questioned your motive or why, and that's trust. And I just don't know any winning relationships that that's not the cornerstone of the foundation. So anyway, these people mm. all believed in that very, very high level. And the last part of team building, um, I purposely did this. I only talked to people that didn't own their own company. Every one of the 11 I talked to worked at a mortgage company. And that wasn't like my mission on setting out. It just so happened that the first like seven were. And so I just figured I'd just make the last four also that. But the eighth chapter is about alignment. And what I really loved was they were all in alignment with their company on where they were headed. All of them. So all of them's executive team or ownership group of their company was crystal clear on what their goals, dreams, and desires were and how to get there. And they all played an active role in helping them get there. They were in alignment. And so some people tell me, oh, alignment doesn't matter. I don't know. These 11 people that all make seven figures a year all told me alignment is absolutely important to their success. And so I guess if you're a loan officer that's not doing as much as you could, maybe check, are you in alignment with your team? You know, is your executive team, do they even care? Do they even know what your goals are? Do they do anything to help you 
you achieve your goals? Because if not, it takes a village. And this is harder than people think. You know a lot of people that do that kind of volume that aren't in alignment with their groups? No, they're all they have to be. It's a it's a prerequisite. We don't think about that all the time, do we? No. So that's kind of why I made that chapter eight, because it was true in all of their instances. So I just thought that was kind of cool. And that kind of ends the first two segments of the three segment book. And it leads us to the last segment, which is chapters nine through 12. And I got introduced to a term called force multipliers that I didn't understand what the word meant. And now that I understand it, it might be the most important part of this book. And basically, a force multiplier, I'm just going to read one excerpt, and you can call it a different name, but it gives you the best impact when you put energy and resources behind it. So it's whatever it is in your business that give you the highest impact when you put energy and resources behind it. Kind of like a catalyst. Yeah. And so like, I'll give you an example like that. Just one thing for me. A guy that you know and I know referred me four pieces of business last year that turned out to be a great deal for me. And I sat around one day and thinking, can I make that 24 and not four this coming year in 2024? Can I make that 24 pieces of business from him instead of four? And what would I have to do for and with him so that he wantingly handed me 24 pieces of business, not four? So think if you're a loan officer, if you have a realtor that referred you 10 deals, what if you could get that realtor to refer you 70 deals instead of mm -hmm. 10? That's a force multiplier. What if there was a technology that if you used it properly, it could not get you three deals this year, it could get you 30 deals this year. So that's kind of what a force multiplier is. And so as we go into this last little chapter, these last four, the first of the four was brand mastery. And this is no shocker to you, but every single one of these 11 felt they were a personal brand. That doesn't mean they spent four grand on logo creation of a roof with a chimney and smoke coming out of it and saying, look how cool my logo is. None of them cared about that. They all, though, believed that they were a brand apart from their company and that mm. their job was to master branding. And it was pretty interesting because some of them did it differently than others, but all of them did it. And what was coolest about all 11 is zero of the 11 was the brand egocentric. 11 of the 11, the brand was benefit rich to the consumer and the referral source. Mm. think about that for one second nothing about me 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 i'm the top i'm the greatest i'm a one percenter no none of that all benefit rich to the consumer or the referral source i loved that would, would that be something like hey we have the funds over at the title company uh at least 24 hours before closing is that is that what you mean like benefit driven to the consumer or the referral partner yes but in addition to that like you know how some people that sell a product, like, let's just say a, a loan officer that's not good at their job. You know they exist, right? Yep. They say something like this. Hey, Carl, I'm in mortgages. I got tons of products. Do you need a loan? These okay. people all said something like, Carl, I have a burning passion. It's my sole and singular focus to help people achieve the goal of home ownership, the American dream. That's why I wake up every day. It's my unequivocal passion. I'm so, so jacked up about it every day. That's what I do. I happen to have 107 different mortgage products so I can find the right loan for whomever it is that has a desire to be a homeowner and establish mm. roots and lay foundations. Would you like to do business with me? Mm. Much more impelling, compelling. They went from the why they do it to the how they do it to the what they do. Everyone else goes to what they do, maybe how they do it, and they never tell you why. Mm. they just reversed the mm. order i like they that went instead of what and how and maybe why to why how and what mm. they do think about that mm. and that each of these people had their own way of that but they mastered branding them and it was always about someone else never mm. about i made seven figures i was the top one person mm. i won the silver medal at my company that's not their branding they like to spike the football occasionally too and i know that's like a part of life we all want to do that once yeah. in a while 
but the brand message to the public was all about the public or the realtor. Mm. I just thought it was cool. Make I, sense? I, I, it makes perfect sense. What's the next one? Coming down the home stretch. Yeah, down the home stretch, time control. They were all freakish about time control. Not yeah. one of them had the day run them. 100% of the 11 ran their day. So if that's not something you're doing, maybe that's one thing you should do is get good. I used to be on the opposite end of the spectrum. First day I met you, I was doing 20% of my working hours, things that I loved, I was great at, and it made me money. Today, I'm 95% because of you. Mm. You taught me something you didn't even know you taught me 10 plus years ago, and it changed my whole life. And it was simply the triad of awesomeness. That's it. Mm. I didn't go to Harvard. I'm not the smartest guy you ever seen, but I could get that. And when you drew those three concentric circles in front of my face one day, I said, holy, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Holy, I've been doing this wrong. And I didn't get it. And it's because I wore a badge of honor that I worked 60 hours a week and I was busy and I had it all wrong. And it took three circles and 20 minutes of your life that changed that for me a decade ago. And I can honestly tell you, I spend 95% of my working hours only doing things that I love, things I'm great at, and things that drive my economic engine. And it was that wake up call that changed it. All 11 of these people got that and they time blocked like maniacs. Do you, do you think mastering that do you, do you think, and I'm not, I'm not trying to lead you. This is a real question. Yeah. Do you think that 90% of it is just being aware yes. of, of how important it is? 100% of it's being aware because you can't prove to me it doesn't work. I, I'm living proof. Mm -hmm. When you don't have a limiting belief system, when you think properly and you understand those three circles, it took me about a year and a half from the day you told me that because you made me do an acts of freedom. Mm -hmm. I had four pages on a yellow pad. I had 89 things. And when you made me grab a green highlighter, you don't even remember this, but this was 2014. You made me grab a green highlighter and I only highlighted five out of 89 things. And you said, that's your new job. And I said, who the hell's going to do the other 84? And you said, we're going to worry about that who in, in, in due time. And it took me a year and a half to get those other 84 off. But now I only do the five a decade later. So it's mm. just awareness and it's mentorship and it's coaching and it's trust. So mm. anyway, I don't mean to go on and on, but these people were and, time and, and, and freaks. And, and, you know, one thing that we didn't address is your team collectively, uh, you guys between two, three, 400 loans a month. Oh yeah. I mean, like significantly more than that. A lot of times. Yeah. 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 So, so this is not a small potatoes operation. This is a, this is a big machine. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, but it's all because of these principles. So no, the, I get it. I get the it. The last two, the the chapter eleven is prospecting and cold calling. And this is no shock to anyone, but all eleven said it was the lifeblood of their business. Interesting. Thinking mattered, strategic discipline mattered, time blocking mattered, but nothing mattered more than prospecting and cold calling. That was that was every one of them prospected on some level every day. It was the lifeblood of the business. It's why they existed, it's why the results come. Mm. And and some folks just refuse to get that and refuse to commit to that. And it's hard. I I prospect every day. And some days the phone gets heavy. And some days I don't like it. But thank God I've surrounded myself with good people that pick me up when I'm down. You know, I have this little website, growingwithkevin.com, and my calendar's on there. About three to five times a day, people go there and fill out a 15-minute block. You know what most of them are talking to me about? Tell me. That the phone's heavy some days. And I mm -hmm. give them encouragement. I give them real life examples of when it gets heavy for me, what I do and just stuff like that. People need to pick me up. They need a friend. They need a brother in arms. They need someone that's going to help them, but don't stop prospecting. Not one of these 11 didn't prospect every single day. Now they didn't do the same things every day. They didn't make cold calls every day. I'm not saying that prospecting comes in many forms. They found the prospecting that worked best for each of them and they did it every day on some level. It was less on Mondays than on Wednesdays, whatever. But none of them didn't prospect daily. Not shocking, right? Yeah. And and my guess is when they say prospecting, they don't mean playing Candy Crush on Facebook either. Uh, oh, zero, like, zero, yeah. zero, zero. Yeah. Many of yeah. them had a social media strategy, but that that that's not prospecting. And putting your, you know, your five-year-old kid blowing out birthday candles is cool. And that's what Facebook's great for. But you've you've always shown me a recent survey that I you showed me three times. But I think only three percent of all closed mortgages in America last year came as a direct result of a social media referral. 
and 60 yeah. percent came from someone that they knew liked or trust or a, or a past client yeah so why the hell are we operating in an area that produces 1 20th of the results of another area right yeah. they, they all got that they all yeah. got that at the highest and i don't don't take this out of context every one of them had a social media presence but it was more strategic and it was more around like like one of them made 59 second videos with realtors on 10 different topics what is inflation why do rates rise and fall what's the importance of a good realtor versus a bad realtor in today's market you know should i buy when rates are at eight percent like things like that and they would strategically place them in different mediums on wednesdays from this time to that time. they had a strategy so i'm not saying they didn't do social media but that wasn't their definition of prospecting that was a separate entity in their business that mattered so that's kind of the last chapter the last chapter is innovation every one of them understood the technological prowess that's required to be massively successful not none of them thought a handshake and a hug and a belly-to-belly -belly conversation didn't matter all of them felt that was totally necessary but every one of them understood the technologies that ran their business they all innovated they all believed that you can't accept status quo. You've recently been introduced and introduced me to something neither of us really talked about 90 days ago. We're not going to sit idly by and just let it pass us by. We're going to use it and we're going to get the best we can at using it, right? Yeah. They were all like that. They were fanatical about innovation. And, and I loved it because I'm not the best techie guy you ever met, but I do know if you don't want to work 30% harder to make 30% less next year, you better adapt some technologies in your, in your business. It's just a guarantee. Yeah. You know what, that, that might make, would make another great episode, uh, Kevin is, uh, you know, the, and I'm just grabbing a number here, Yeah. the seven technologies you must have, or, you know, you're 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 going to be hosed you know kind of thing because i think i, I know what they are and if you ever want to have another one of these or whatever i'd be happy to do that man i'm not i'm not that bright but i i've been studying a lot and uh i'm a lifelong learner and i don't think for mm. a second i know one ounce more than anyone else but i do try every day to get better and if i do have some insight in that topic if you ever thought that was time well spent i'd be happy to try to help let's, let's schedule i like that all right so great stuff uh kevin i love the book and um yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, all right, so I, I guess the big question is, uh, how do they get a copy of the book? You know, Carl, it's a great question. You're going to be somewhat embarrassed for me because of the answer, but I didn't really write it to sell it. I wrote it to help the loan officers at our company have a better life. Um, but you have a boot camp coming up anytime soon? I do. I, we have a we have a boot camp uh, coming up here uh, uh, pretty soon, actually. It's, all right. Uh, Here's what I'll do. I'll come to it if you'll invite me and I'll bring, I'll ship a couple boxes, of, huge boxes of the books and uh, I'll give a signed copy to anyone that wants one at your event. Does that make sense? You know what? That actually that falls in perfect. So I've got a, you know, this, this, uh, this falls in perfect. All right. So here's what you do. And I know some of you are walking and uh, are, are riding your bicycle or at the gym. Uh, make sure you uh, earmark this uh, where this is at. Cause I'm going to give you a couple things and, and I'm going to give you a, a great black Friday discount. So as we're recording, this uh, it's coming up on Thanksgiving, black Friday. And so if you go to mastermindretreats.com, mastermindretreats.com on the coupon code, if you put black Friday, 400, all one word, black Friday, 400, I'll pay the first four hundred dollars of your ticket, and uh, and that'll give you VIP uh, seating. And at this uh, at this boot camp, we're actually doing for the first time ever. We're doing a great marriage of talking about the daily success plan and the rituals that the top uh, uh, producers do, and how they're using AI to automate and accelerate a lot of these things. So it's like fifty percent daily success plan. 50% is uh, about the uh, the AI operated loan officer. Uh, really good stuff. We're going to be showing some case studies. And so again, uh, mastermindretreats.com. And then when it says discount code, put in Black Friday 400, which means that $400 of that stays right in your pocket. Black Friday 400, all one word, no spaces. Uh, and you don't need to cap it. Cap, uncap, it doesn't matter. Black Friday 400, 
and I'll pay $400 and we'll have some of the books. You get to meet Kevin and Kevin, uh, man, we'll, uh, we'll love to get you up on stage and you give us, uh, uh, give us an update on, on how things are going uh, for the for the loan officers you're tracking. Good stuff, buddy. Thank you so much for having me, Carl. I appreciate it. I hope it brought some sort of value to someone today. That's, you know, why we do this, right? Well, it sure did to me. That's, uh, that's <laughs> if, if it helps nobody but me, well, it wasn't, it wasn't lost. But no, this, dude, this is great information. And this really goes into those things. You know, we already know these things. It's just bringing it to our attention, bringing it to the surface, and understanding these are the things that these uh, 11 loan officers you talk to had in common. 100% of them had these 11 things in common that made that uh, funded over $100 million. So, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to uh, run with the big dogs, as we say here in the South, uh, you got to get off the porch. You got to right. get off the porch. So good right. stuff, Kevin. I love you, man. Great information. Love you too. Appreciate Thank you, you so much. Appreciate you. And I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. All right. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate y'all being here. And so mastermindretreats.com, coupon code Black Friday 400. Uh, we'll see you at the next Mastermind Retreat. And we'll also see you on the next episode of Loan Officer Freedom. Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye.